So up next, we have uh, Mark Jones, uh, who's on part of public invention, discussing the legal perspective that you all might be questioning um, your projects on where you stand legally as a volunteer project. Thank you, Mark. Mute button, I got hidden on me. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of what goes through a lawyer's head when people start asking questions about this. Um, the way I did, I literally made this presentation was that Rob kept asking me questions about like production and manufacturing. So one of those times when he asked me that question, I just wrote down my thought process. Um, so a little bit, a little bit about standard presentations of lawyers. So I am a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Um, that's probably not a really acronym. It's a bit longer. I work as general counsel at Civic Actions, which is an IT professional services company. None of this is legal advice, nor will be any of my answers to any questions people might have. Uh, this is the last cat photo, but I, I like the fact that the marketing person at my company is always slipping in cat photos into our, our templates for slide decks. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm not a maker. I don't come from the maker community. Um, I do make lots of typos, so if you find any in there, that's probably not a surprise. My background in as a lawyer is working in the free, free and open source software community. So I do a lot of work with pro bono, pro bono work with free software and nonprofits. Um, before I went in house to work at a private company, I worked at the Software Freedom Law Center, which specialized in free and open source software licensing. I do have some experience with open hardware licensing, um, but mostly what I'm going to be talking about today is really kind of risk management and limiting liability. I'm going to talk about this from like, you know, like a thousand feet kind of perspective, um, because just based on some of the questions I get from a lot of people, it's like people are concerned about the risks they have and how to manage them. Um, and there are some pretty common things that lawyers think about what, what creates risk um, and then solutions to solving that. So um, it will be it will be pretty general, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what lawyers are usually thinking about when these questions get asked. So brief overview. I'm going to go over the types of liability. The intention here is not to scare you. Um, it's just kind of like these, this is literally like the checklist I went down the last time Rob and I had a conversation about like managing liability. I'm like, okay, what are all the different ways that someone could be liable? Uh, I'm a lawyer. My, my head goes to dark places. Like that's my job. Uh, people who create things, makers, inventors, entrepreneurs, you should be positive. You should be looking about how you help the world. Uh, you hire lawyers to be the pessimist and to think about how things can go wrong and to help manage that risk. Um, so the first thing I always start with is like, what can go wrong? Um, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the risk management techniques that are commonly used by people who are doing things, who are creating things, who are taking risks, um, and how you can, you can limit your, your potential for being held viable. Um, and then I'll also just kind of briefly go at like a typical free software uh, project looks like, because that's my experience. Um, with this community, we're mostly talking about dealing with products, so it's going to look a little bit different. Um, and, you know, and to be honest, like the risk of liability inside of dealing with products is a little bit higher than when you're dealing with free software. It's actually probably a lot higher, but that's the rough outline. Um, and then I was told to leave some time for questions, so hopefully this doesn't take too long. So types of liability. Um, so in my head, the first things I'm going through, right, is I'm thinking about criminal liability. Well, I mean, just don't break laws, right? Like that's don't do that. So we're not really concerned about here. Like no, one, no one's trying to be a criminal by doing this stuff. But then there's civil liability and there's a couple different types, right? So first thing I'm thinking about are torts. Torts are things like assault, battery, conversion, trespass. If you walk into someone else's land without their permission, that's a general tort. Um, I'm also thinking about regulatory compliance, right? Like you can be fined if you're doing things that are in violations of regulations. I'm also thinking about contractual liability too that if you start giving things away to people, you're taking money from people, like you might be having a contract. Even if there's no piece of paper, um, contracts still exist. The reason why we have paper contracts is so that they're explicit, not to create them. Contracts are created all the time orally. Every time you bought a candy bar at a gas station, you had an oral contract for that transaction. Um, so they do happen. And sometimes when you do these, uh, these oral transactions, you still have implied warranties that are taking place. So those are the general categories that I'm thinking about. Breaking that down a little bit more, torts, like, it, yes, we're thinking about torts generally. That's how civil liability happens, but it's really two specific torts that I think about when you're talking about product liability or any kind of manufacturing or business. It's neg negligence, and what I would typically think of as product liability, but really that's code for strict liability. We'll talk about those a little bit more. 
for contracts, you know, I think that's the bigger risk is like, okay, breach of contract. Like, did you, did you promise you would do something? You didn't do that. Well, if we're talking about product liability, that really means breach of warranty. Like we have to dig into that a little bit more. What kind of warranties we might be giving people by engaging in these activities. Um, and then regulatory compliance. And I know there's a couple of people who already talked about regulatory compliance today. I am not an expert in FDA approval. I don't know anything about that. Um, I'm general counsel at a company. My solution to that would be to hire an attorney who's an expert in FDA compliance. Like that's how you manage that stuff. This stuff gets very technical and very specific. So when you're dealing with any regulated industry, like you follow the regulations, you talk to people who know about it. So I think it's great that we had like people like Pierre on, uh, on the conference today who can really talk about it. Even if they're not an attorney, if they are experienced in that field, they probably know more than most attorneys unless you're talking to an attorney who's also an expert in that field. And even then, you know, Pierre as an actual doer in that field who's managing a database is gonna bring perspective. So their, their insights around that are really valuable. And from a practical, let's get things done, um, lawyers probably sh might not even be your first stop, right? Because lawyers are gonna tell you about all the risks. They're not gonna tell you how to be successful necessarily. So I'm not gonna talk about regulatory compliance really much besides that. Um, I will talk about uh, torts though uh, a little bit because a lot of times people have questions like, well, you know, what if I do this? What does it really mean? What am I actually liable? So negligence is kind of like the, the granddaddy or the grandmother of all torts. It's a, it's a big catch-all. It's the most common reason why people get sued today um, or they're concerned about it. Every time you hear about a slip and fall case, it's probably a negligence case. So what does negligence mean for an attorney or for someone who's about to get sued for it? Negligence, torts are always broken down to what they call elements. So negligence has four elements. Each one of these four things has to exist. For negligence, you have to have a duty to someone else. You have to breach that duty. As a result of that breach of duty, this is causation, it's listed fourth. I don't know why it's the convention. As a result of breaching that duty, you cause a harm or an injury to someone else. It's pretty straightforward. What makes this interesting and complicated is what your duty is. So the duty under negligence is you have to exercise the care of a reasonably prudent person as they would in similar circumstances. Uh, the classic example of this going back 100 years is like the man on the omnibus. People drive, you know, the average person who's riding a bus around the city of London is the classic example of it. Uh, when I was in law school, the definition of a reasonably prudent person that my professor gave to me is a reasonably prudent person is the kind of person that your mother wants you to hang out with. When you were in middle school, that person your mom wanted you to be friends with, that was the reasonably prudent person. They don't drink. They certainly don't drink and, uh, and then drive within 24 hours. They're always going to wait a long time. They don't take risks. They don't skydive. They don't go bungee jumping. They don't steer near the edge of the cliff. That's what a reasonably prudent person is. They're fairly conservative. It doesn't mean they never drive, right? Taking a drive, driving in your car, it's one of the most likely ways that you can die. It is a risk. Reasonably prudent people do take risks, but they take reasonable risks, right? So, you know, a risk in life you might have is getting married, right? Like the kind of attention you should be putting into a making a decision about marriage. That's reasonably prudent people make smart decisions about who they're going to marry. So when you commit negligence, it's when you're, you're not making reasonable decisions. And as a result of your failure to make a reasonable decision, someone else was injured because of that, right? That could be a bodily injury, that could be a financial injury, some limited cases, it could be an emotional injury. But that's what people are talking about when someone's negligent. It's not just that you did something that resulted in someone else being harmed. Like as long as you were acting reasonable, you weren't negligent. The other one that comes into this too is strict liability. I tend to think of this as product liability, really kind of depends upon what state you're in or what country you're in. Strict liability is a higher standard. It usually talks about with products. Um, and when you're dealing with strict liability, it kind of doesn't matter if you behaved reasonably or not. The point is that you did something and an injury occurred, but it's not as, it's not as scary as that sounds for most people. It's, did you engage in an activity or conduct that was inherently dangerous or inherently unreasonable, right? So if you're setting off fireworks, that would be considered what lawyers would call like an ultra hazardous activity. So if you're, if you're setting off fireworks or you're dynamiting things, if you've got a backyard pond and you start fishing with dynamite and someone's near the pond that you don't know about, maybe even reasonably, but no reason to know about it because you've got fences up and there's no way people can get in, 
but you're setting off dynamite to go fishing. Like this is an ultra hazardous activity. Like you just need to be careful, right? Owning wild animals, tigers, classic example. If you own a tiger, the tiger hurts somebody, doesn't matter how careful we were, you're strictly liable for that. The fact the tiger caused the damage to someone else, like you're responsible for that. Depending upon what state you're in, what jurisdiction you're in, medical devices, and this is what we're talking about here, right? And for this conference is, and different kinds, right? Because there's, there's the um, kinds that can be internal, times that are external. Um, it may or may not be. Uh, there was a court case, I think back in March before COVID-19 actually hit, where the question for the Pennsylvania courts was, do medical devices that have defects, are those, those, can you get, can you sue someone in strict liability for a defect in that? It's an open question. It's not clear. My point to bringing this up is not to scare people, but to be aware of the risks around this, right? I'm not gonna give you an answer today about what you're doing, whether or not that you could be sued in strict liability. These are the kind of things that become really fact specific, right? Because it's the activities you're engaging in. So things we've heard about today is like keeping track of your designs, paying attention to regulatory compliance. All of these things are gonna go into like the quality of your products and how reasonable you are. Um, so there are risks around it, but this is, these are the frameworks that things have to get fit inside of them. Um, the last one that I'll really kind of go into, breach of warranty. Br breach of warranty comes with contracts. Um, in every contract sold to consumers, not every contract, but contracts that are sold to consumers has an implied warranty of merchantability. It's basically the idea that any product that you sell to a consumer, right? If you sell somebody a, if you sell a consumer a pool toy, right? Like a floating bed kind of thing, right? You make a warranty that the products fit for the ordinary, that ordinary purpose, right? You're not making a warranty that you could use that as a sled to go sliding down a hill on, but you are making the warranty that, you know, you could float on it in a pool, right? And you, and if you, if you, if it doesn't float, people can claim breach of warranty. They, normally you return it to a store and you get your money back because the, the pool float didn't work, right? You promised that it did. That gets implied every and every product sold to consumers. Selling things to consumers, being used on consumers, involving personal injury, there is a greater risk associated with all of these things because the law is designed to protect the ordinary person. So anytime you get really close to like individual consumers, unsophisticated consumers, uh, engaging activities that might harm somebody, the law gets very particular about it and you should be careful about it. It's not to say that you shouldn't do it, but you wanna be careful about it. There are ways of limiting it, which I'll get into. Breach of warranty is a really um, common one. Um, implied warranty of merchantability is often disclaimed when you're dealing with things that are distributed for free, right? So if you look at free software licenses, um, almost every free software license out there has built into it a disclaimer about the implied warranty of merchantability because you're doing it, you know, gratis, right? Like you don't, you want to, you want to help other people, but you don't want to carry all this risk when you're not really asking to be paid. Um, and that actually does get calculated into like the intentions behind what people are doing and how, how liable might someone be underneath a negligence claim, right? If you're doing it gratuitously versus if you're getting paid. So now that I've probably scared a couple people because I told you about all the ways, theories that people might, might be able to sue you, um, let's talk a little bit about managing risk, right? Every business out there carries these risks, right? And they're addressing them, right? So every day at my job, people are always asking me questions about like, hey, am I allowed to do this? Um, I wanna do this, or we did this yesterday. Like somebody told me I should talk to the company lawyer. I'm like, okay, well, we have to think about how do we manage these risks, right? If I told my company not to do, take any risks, I wouldn't have a salary. The company wouldn't be in business. Like I said, Driving a car, it's a risk. You could die in a car accident if you're in a car, but we're all always taking risks. It's about managing that process, right? You wanna manage it smartly in recognition of the world that we live in. So ways you can manage risk, right? You can limit the harm you're likely to cause. Don't engage in ultra hazardous activities, right? Like don't own a tiger, don't own a chimpanzee, don't drive 120 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone, right? Like these are ways of limiting the harm that you could do to other people. That's one way of managing risks. You can also limit your likelihood of being held liable, right? Um, so maybe you're engaging in activities where you're not the person who's actually doing it. Um, you can also limit the extent of your liability, right? Like it's one thing to be held liable for a pool float that fails, right? You sold for five bucks, okay, you might be liable for $5. That's a risk that I can absorb with my salary. It's not something I'm really worried about. 
On the other hand, I'm a lot more concerned, you know, if I've got a pool in my backyard um, and I have kids in the neighborhood coming over and I'm not supervising them, right? Like, oh my God, the harm that you could do to a small child in my pool, I can't absorb the liability risk around that, right? Like that's a big deal. I can't afford to have that child die. Also, I don't want the child to die, but I can't afford it if they do, right? When I get sued, I'm gonna lose my house. Um, I'm gonna lose my retirement. So how do we manage these risks? So there's pretty common ways of doing it. And the closer and closer you get to engaging in activities that are likely to cause harm, or you're closer to distributing to the general public or consumers, you wanna start thinking about what's appropriate risk management steps you wanna take for yourself, right? Um, and this will depend upon your unique situation, right? So like I said before, this is kind of the checklist. This is like a little bit of insight into a lawyer's mind. In the, five, in the first five seconds you ask a lawyer about like, am I allowed to do this? This is the checklist that I run through at least for my clients. Is So how do you limit harm, right? You could use best practices in developing products, right? Like make sure you're going about it in the conventional way. If you're doing it in the conventional way, right? Like you're doing studies that are scientifically valid, not just testing it once and then saying, oh, it's fine. If you're writing down the results and you're keeping a log of all of your testing results, as opposed to just kind of testing it. And then at the end of a half an hour of testing and saying like, I remember it going pretty well. Um, if you're following best products for product development for scientific research, that's what reasonable people do. Right. That's that's what's that's what a normal scientist is going to do. That's what a normal inventor is going to do. That's that's normal. You're going to be less likely to be found negligence if you're following those best practices. Don't just wing stuff. Follow safety procedures. Right. Like if you're dealing with something that's dangerous, you want to think about that. Right. We had a conversation inside of public invention the other day about like sending science kits to children. Be like, okay, well, what safety procedures should go in place here? Like, what's the appropriate age group for this? Like, what actually what materials do we need to give them? What warnings do we need to give them? How do we tell them how to be safe? You can't just give, put someone in a situation where they might be at risk of harming themselves and then say, oh, whatever, it's safety's on you. And I'm like, if you created the situation, you want to think about it. If you're participating in the situation, you want to think about that. Training. Are you qualified to do the thing that you're working on, right? There's lots of smart people on this call. There are lots of people on this call who are much smarter than me. Are you trained to do the thing that you're working on? If you're not, what can you do to educate yourself? Be aware about this. Training doesn't mean necessarily that you have a license. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a PhD, but it does mean that you took the time to educate yourself in some way. That could mean lots of different things depending upon what you're doing, right? I'm not qualified to go welding. My brother-in-law is. He doesn't have a graduate degree. He doesn't have an undergraduate degree. I will walk on a bridge. I will drive across a bridge. I have driven across bridges that he has worked on. I will not drive across a bridge where they put me in charge of welding. That would be insane, right? I don't have the training for it. Have an effective QA in process, right? No one's perfect. Don't assume that you're perfect. Check the quality of your work. That's what reasonable people do. It's because it reduces the likelihood of harm to other people. Don't engage in ultra hazardous activities. If your current production process for building a ventilator somehow involves dynamite, don't do that. It doesn't need to be, and it's an ultra hazardous activity. Same thing with tigers, eliminate them, right? But don't push the risks too far, right? Think about what activities you actually want to engage in. And if you're going to engage in ultra hazardous activities, be aware that your likelihood of harming someone else has increased and you should be comfortable with that risk. The other thing you can do to avoid harming other people is just don't do anything. And I put this in here to make the point of that's not gonna happen, right? Even if I don't drive my car, I still gonna walk down the street. I'm gonna go to the grocery store. I might bump into someone. It's impossible not to take some risks in life. So the solution to this is not don't do anything. That's not possible, right? It's about being aware of the risks that you're taking and thinking about the likelihood that you might cause someone else harm because you can't avoid that. We're all taking risks every day. Limiting the likelihood of you being liable. This is where a little bit more like we're lawyers, uh, actually, you know, engineers might get into this involved in this too, but it's a lot of the same stuff, right? It's using those best practices. It's following safety procedures. It's the QA process. Uh, comply with the regulations. If it's a regulated device that you're building or if it's a regulated industry that you're working with, comply with those regulations. Those regulations are there for a reason. Somebody had experience. We generally do not make rules unless someone decided, whoops, I guess we need a rule for that. 
we probably have rules because at some point in time, someone said we didn't have a rule for that and someone got hurt. Or we definitely need a rule for this because if people do this, people are gonna get hurt. So comply with those regulations. If you're in compliance with regulations, you're a lot less likely to be held liable or at least it won't come out for you as bad. Licensure, um, I'm a practicing attorney. I have multiple licenses in multiple states. Is it a guarantee against um, you know, one of my clients suffering from my mistakes? No, um, it's certainly not. Just because I have a license doesn't mean I can't make mistakes. Um, and you know what, I have made mistakes. I've made mistakes that have affected my clients. It happens, it happens to everyone. But licensure is another common way of doing it. Like if, you, if you're working on an activity um, that you, that's normally requires licensure to do that, you might wanna think talking about those people on that. Um, you don't wanna fall prey to thinking that you know everything. Um, people with licensure have been tested on it. Presumably they know what needs to be done in that field. If you don't have a license in it, check with someone who has just a license. It. They'll be able to give you a bigger picture on it. Should. Um, so limiting your likelihood of liability. Don't engage in ultra hazardous activities. I put this on here is because there's a higher standard for people who are engaging in these activities. Like you're much more likely to be found liable if you're engaged in ultra hazardous activities because strict liability might apply. It's not just about whether or not you're being reasonable. By engaging in that ultra hazardous activity, you already took yourself kind of out of the reasonableness box. Uh, don't create or distribute consumer products, right? Dealing with consumers charges you with more responsibility. You have to protect consumers. We expect people who are engaging in commercial transactions with ordinary citizens to protect them. If you're gonna make a lawnmower and sell it to consumers and they're gonna hurt themselves, like we're probably gonna come after you for that. That is why there are so many stickers, there are so many safety devices on these things is because they're consumer products. On the other hand, if you're working with another company, if you're working with other inventions, if you're working with what's normally called a sophisticated party, you're not gonna have that same standard um, applied against you, right? Because the sophisticated party is sophisticated. They understand the risk, right? So you want to think about that too. The other thing you can try and do is disclaim warranties. Um, that's not always effective, right? Sometimes you can't disclaim warranties. The most common places you can't disclaim warranties generally involves consumer products or ultra hazardous activities, because again, we don't really care whether or not you put on a warranty disclaimer on that lawnmower. If it's routinely chopping off people's fingers, we don't want you selling them. We want you to go out of business. Um, so it depends upon what you're doing. The most paperworky and probably the thing that most people engage lawyers for, um, especially if you're dealing with outside counsel, are just limiting the extent of your liability, right? The most common thing that people are gonna do is they're gonna incorporate. Literally the whole point of incorporation is to limit your liability. That is the point of incorporation. Corporations are another legal person. They're responsible for the actions of it, not the shareholders. LLCs stand for limited liability company. The point of it is to limit your liability. This is why people incorporate. If you're gonna start creating things, distributing things that are actually gonna to touch people's lives, you probably want to incorporate to shield your personal responsibility from it. That's what corporations are for. It is not a guarantee though. Other things that people do to limit their life, limit the extent of their liability, get insurance. I've got a hot tub at my house. I have homeowner's insurance. I made sure my homeowner's insurance acknowledges the fact that I had a hot tub, right? Like I pay attention to that stuff. I have car insurance, not just because it's required by my state, but it exceeds that, right? I think about how much liability I have and I buy insurance to help cover me that because I can't necessarily afford all of that. On the other hand, I don't buy insurance when I buy a boom box or even when I buy a computer. That's a waste of money. I can afford to absorb $500 if it turns out my computer blows up or catches on fire. I'm fine with that risk, right? I am not fine with absorbing the risk of my nephew drowning in my hot tub. Like I'm not okay with that. I have liability insurance around it to make sure that if I harm someone else, the insurance company will pay them and make them whole and it won't, it won't hurt me financially or at least not too much. Insurance is a good thing. Another really common thing. Incorporate, not, not, not everyone incorporates and gets insurance, but it's probably the second most common thing that happens there. Um, other things you can do to limit your liability. Transferring liability to other parties, dealing with intermediaries, right? Public invention, we have this conversation. We don't manufacture and distribute um, personal medical devices. Um, we'd be more than happy to have someone take our designs and manufacture them and, distrib and distribute them to individuals. That's fine. 
um, that's putting an intermediary between us, right? Like if someone else is going to engage in the activity, then they're gonna have some liability. So thinking about those relationships, do you wanna be the person who's actually dealing directly with the consumer? You made the medical device that's being implanted in their body. Maybe you don't wanna be, maybe you wanna partner with someone else who can take that risk because they're, they know how to manage those risks. You can disclaim warranties, we talked about a little bit before. Um, last couple of things, Volunteer Protection Act and similar acts to state law. If you incorporate as a nonprofit and you're a legitimate nonprofit, um, especially if you've got insurance, um, we want to encourage people as a society to engage in charitable activities, to do good things for the world. We limit the liability of people who are volunteering for nonprofits. We are much less likely to hold someone responsible for making a mistake if they're doing it in a charitable capacity. So we have statutes in most states and at the federal level that says if you're a volunteer for a nonprofit, we probably will not hold you responsible for your actions as long as you didn't do it like intentionally or recklessly. If you were merely negligent, you're not gonna be held responsible. That's the general rule there. Um, the last one is be judgment proof, um, which is basically to say like, if you have no assets, it's not worth suing you. Um, that might sound a little bit ridiculous. Most of us are probably sitting in homes um, that we're proud of. We probably have cars, we have some kind of assets. Um, my experience as a lawyer in private practice is I mostly worked with nonprofits, free software nonprofits. Guess what? They were all judgment proof. They didn't have a lot of assets. There's no point in suing them. Um, you can't really, because you're not going to be able to go after the people working on the project. They were volunteers. And since the nonprofit didn't have a lot of money, that's who didn't sue us. We didn't have a lot of patent trolls coming after us. We didn't have a lot of copyright trolls coming after us. Just like, go ahead and sue us. Like, we'll, you'll put the nonprofit out of business. It gives you a bad headline. And then we'll go start a new nonprofit. That's fine. Um, so that's possible. Um, so just real quickly, like typically what it happens for nonprofit free software projects, they often incorporate, they use free software licenses that contain warranty disclaimers. They generally do not sell directly to consumers. They do their best to comply with laws and their contractual obligations, and they get liability insurance, especially if they're engaging in actual activities like holding events or distributing products. And they get DNOs insurance, which is a special kind of insurance for people who are managing a company that says, yeah, if the company makes a mistake, you know, the company, the insurance company will um, take care of the liability that people who are sitting on the board might have. Does anyone okay. have any questions? Yes, great. Thank you, Mark. I think um, we've got some questions here. Um, so uh, do you have any insight on the dichotomy between a warranty disclaimer on open source licenses and the fitness for purpose or the intended use requirement for medical devices? Um, so, so generally what you're going to find is that you've, the people on this call have chosen to play with medical devices. We're talking about being much closer to a person. Um, the warranty disclaimers you will find in free software licenses have been vetted by you know, every major company in the world, essentially. They're generally okay with using those licenses, but software to be used on machines, not directly put into people's bodies or touching people's bodies, it's a little bit different. So they are generally considered effective warranties. Most companies are comfortable dealing with them, even the sophisticated counsel. I would check um, to make sure that my intended use related to a medical device, the warranty was actually effective. Um, they were not designed for that purpose. They were designed for a different purpose. So you can't just repurpose those things. You're in a different field. Okay, great. Um, I think you've answered some of the questions that have been raised about limited liability companies. Would you suggest even as an individual to do that, um, to limit your personal liability? Um, cause, because some of these are sort of turning in from more of a, a hobby to something that could be more serious. Um, yeah. So again, everyone's situation is different. So the answer is always going to be maybe anytime you ask an attorney who, um, who you haven't retained as your counsel. So maybe it depends upon the situation. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're going to incorporate even as an LLC, um, you need to make sure you go through the corporate formalities. Those are actually really important. Just having an LLC is not an absolute shield. That's why there's other, other steps that are there. One of the things you want to make sure you're doing is running the company as a company, doing the corporate formalities so that you show that you're actually engaging as a corporation and not as an individual. Okay. Um, um, related to that too, you don't necessarily have to own yours. To echo what Rob was saying before, like it's important to work together as a community. So if you do have a project, it is adding a lot of value. You're thinking about incorporating, 
you could also approach another established nonprofit that has a similar interest and say, hey, can I do this underneath your umbrella, which might save you some of the overhead of running your own company, but allow you to continue on as a volunteer underneath their umbrella. Okay, great. Um, and one question is, how would you suggest limiting the liability, perhaps of say the design team, um, when they're transferring the project to a medical manufacturer? Um, I mean, I guess it, it, it really, again, it's going to depend. It's all, it always depends, right? Um, I think if you're dealing with a medical manufacturer, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you understand the relationship. I would be really shocked if any medical manufacturer was either, they're either going to take your design and they're not going to really talk to you or they're just going to take it, in which case, great, that's probably all I hope for. You can say, I have no relationship with them. They did things. I shared knowledge with the world. It's not my fault what they did with it. They did what they did. Um, if they want to contract with you, um, you know, be careful about that. Um, my job pretty much every day is writing transactional contracts. One of the things that I fight about that no one else in my company cares about is limitations of liability and warranty clauses. Yeah. Um, read any agreements that you have. And if you don't feel comfortable with the agreement you're reading, talk to an attorney to find out if you're actually getting a fair deal out of it. Okay, great. Um, in, in the emergence, just one more question. In the emergency situation that we're in, uh, how would the rules be the same or would they, you'd still have to go through the normal processes or are the rules more relaxed in terms of say EUA? Uh, yeah, EUA? Um, so the emergency use authorization, as I understand it, relates more to the approval process for the FDA. Um, mm -hmm. There is such a thing as emergency underneath the law. And again, like if you're dealing with negligence, it's acting reasonable underneath the circumstances, right? But the situation we're in right now, right? I remember really having like COVID-19 hit home for me and my wife, like the last week of uh, March, right? We went out to dinner on Saturday night and we woke up Sunday morning. We we're like, that was crazy. We absolutely should not have done that. Um, that was what, five months ago, right? Skipping over formalities, like it's, it's not an emergency anymore, at least not as far as the law is concerned, right? Like we've been working on this for a while. You cannot create your own emergencies by saying, well, I did all of this work. I built a great ventilator, but then somebody wanted it and I just didn't have time to do the testing. Like, well, yeah, but you had five or six months. Like you need, you need to think about that beforehand. It's, this is not a situation where you're walking down the street and you see somebody in a swimming pool drowning. Like that's an emergency. If you don't do it now, someone's gonna die. You didn't create the situation, but if you put off putting in these protections, like you're just making choices about how you're managing risk. The failure to plan ahead is not an emergency, right? Like you do need to think about that in advance. And some of these things do take time. One of the things I typically advise my clients is do not come to me at the last minute trying to solve this problem. I will frustrate you and you will get a worse deal. You have to think about these as you go along. So try to anticipate. It is not to say that if this is your hobby project now, um, you need to run out and incorporate before you do anything. When I was in private practice, I used to get requests like all the time and our, our answer was always the same. Like, when you have running code, come back to us and we will help you make a nonprofit. But if you don't have running code, I'm not gonna waste my time making a nonprofit for you because I'd make lots of silly nonprofits that did nothing. But depends on your circumstances, think about what your plans are. If you're starting to think and get serious, maybe start thinking about what expenses are, figure out what the timelines are on it. Honestly, when I, we created public invention, I think it was a year ago, a year and a half ago, it literally took an hour and a half for me to create the public entity, uh, to create the corporation. It did not take that long. Um, you can get insurance in a couple days if it's actually your priority. Like these things aren't that hard, but you need to do it in advance. You need to think about these things. So these are just other things to think about, but you know, do them at the time that it makes sense for your project in your situation. Great, thank you. I think that was very helpful to a lot of us working on projects who might be coming up to that point <clears throat> to take it more seriously, either to contract out or look at manufacturing in some other way. So thank you so much, Mark. That was very good information. Um, what we have coming up now is our project showcase. I'll turn that over to uh, Robert Reed and Pierre.
Thanks. I'd like to bring Mark back for just a second because I noticed a question from Mike Paddock, who I happen to know is the chief engineer of EWB USA. And he asked, if your work is being done as a volunteer, what protection does the USA Volunteer Protection Act provide? Um, so generally, the Volunteer Protection Act makes it so that you are not liable for actions you took as a volunteer on behalf of a I, you know, I don't think it's all nonprofits. It might be just charitable nonprofits. So Rob at the start of his talk mentioned that public convention is a 501c3. 501c3s are also known as charitable nonprofits. There are other kinds of 501c's that are not charitable. I think the Volunteer Protection Act is that. So if you're volunteering for a nonprofit, I think specifically charitable nonprofits, and you do something that's negligent, sometimes called ordinary negligence, um, that's where that protection is designed to come in. If you start engaging in things that are reckless or grossly negligent or intentional, if you intentionally hurt somebody, it doesn't matter if you're a volunteer or not. Like that's not the extent of it. But there's a general protection for people who are engaging in negligent activities while they're volunteering for a charitable nonprofit. And that can actually, it's, it's kind of complicated. It's basically considered state by state. So just because there's a federal law on this, don't think it's the same in the entire country. The way it's structured is that states actually have the ability to modify the level of protection in their state. Thank you very much.